Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us in this video. Today we have an exciting topic to delve in. We'll be talking about VM Cloud and AWS service in the Melbourne region and exploring its implications for our valued customers in Australia, New Zealand, and beyond. I'm Satya Sresta, a senior staff multi-cloud solutions architect here at VMware. And alongside with me is Dan Frith, a distinguished expert for VM Cloud and AWS service at VMware. So without any further delay, let's dive right into. All right, Dan, let's begin with discussing VM Cloud and AWS. Could you break it down for us in simpler terms and explain how and why our customers and partners find value in using this service? Yeah, thanks, Satya. So VMware Cloud on AWS is a jointly engineered cloud service from VMware and AWS. So when you think about cloud, there's a, there's a few ways you can approach it. Historically, we've had customers deploying vSphere on, on premises in their own data centers, usually on their own hardware. Mm -hmm. And you'd have the normal components like vSphere, vCenter server, and then you'd attach storage to that and run your workloads. But nowadays we have the option to run VMware Cloud on AWS hardware, still in your own data center, but not on what we call an outpost. So you get access to vSphere, vSAN for storage, and you get NSX for software-defined networking capability. This all sits on AWS hardware and can reside in a customer's data center. And when we refer to VMware Cloud on AWS, most of the time we're talking about VMC on AWS sitting inside an AWS region on mm -hmm. AWS global infrastructure. So with that, you still get access to vCenter server, and it runs vSphere, the latest versions of that, uh, vSAN for your software-defined storage, and NSX for your software-defined networking capability. Mm -hmm. Now, all of this also gives you access to native AWS services, should you choose to. Over about 200 of those are available in all of the AWS regions. And we have great proximity to those services via the VMware Cloud on AWS service. Right. And a key thing to think about it as well is that this is all managed by VMware for you. So it's a fully managed service uh, operated by VMware and, and co-engineered by VMware and AWS. Got it. So in this diagram, as I, can, as I can see here, so the green block there is customers on-prem data center, and also that VMware Cloud AWS Outpost is also sitting in their own customer data center, right? That's right. Yeah. So some of our customers, uh, you know, uh, latency sensitive, um, have applications that simply can't be too far from from you know their their, their center of data, as it were. Mm -hmm. So they need to host their, those workloads on the customer data center, but they don't necessarily want to, um, you know, build their own stack, or they don't want to use you know off the shelf components. They want to use the AWS hardware. Some other customers already have a presence in VMware Cloud on AWS, mm -hmm. and the AWS on Outpost uh, extends that capability into their own data centers as well. Right. So VMware Cloud AWS Outpost. Is it available globally and also within the ANZ regions? Yes, it is available uh, available globally. There are a few out there now, and it, there are more and more being shipped every month. Yeah. Got it. So now in terms of that VMware Cloud AWS sitting on AWS Global Infrastructure, what is the advantage of that and why our customers are using it? Can you tell us some use cases, why they are using it? Yeah, so one of the great things about uh, VMware Cloud on AWS is that in terms of your, your skills required to manage the platform, mm -hmm. if you've been using you know, vSphere, vSAN, and NSX for the last you know, 10 to 15 years, then VMware Cloud on AWS is going to be no surprise to you. It really is VMware software running on top of AWS bare metal hardware. So we don't virtualize vSphere on top of AWS or anything crazy like that. When you log into it, you log into vCenter, you see everything that you would if you were managing your environment on premises. Right. So for customers, the change uh, you know, in their skills requirements, in their day-to-day their -day operations are fairly minimal. Um, and this is a really, I guess, a rapid way to get traditional vSphere workloads up into a cloud environment. Yes. And then it also gets them a lot closer to those native services. So if they are leveraging you know, things like EC2 and S3 in Amazon, um, mm -hmm. they can also have their more traditional workloads that may have been sitting on vSphere previously, right. still on vSphere, but up in that AWS ecosystem. Okay, so that proximity to all those interesting services from AWS, they can just directly leverage it from VMware Cloud and AWS, right, with the traditional workloads? Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of the costing model, right, this one is mainly OPEX-oriented, I would imagine. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. The way we charge for VMware Cloud and AWS, primarily it's for a host-based uh, mm -hmm. cost. So you buy a host or you buy a minimum of two hosts in a software-defined data center. And from there, then you can you scale it out as required. But we have the option to do this on demand. Mm -hmm. uh, so you pay a certain price for that. You can do on a yearly subscription, and then you can do a three-yearly subscription as well. Uh, and I know many of our customers, they are moving from CapEx to OpEx model uh, because of that on-demand nature and then how you know their finances wants to look at those expenses, right? So that's good. Okay, uh, now in terms of uh, Melbourne Reason launch, I know we, until recently, we only had Reason in Sydney. Now, tell us about the Melbourne Reason launch, why it is important, why is our customer excited about it, and why they should be excited about it, and what are the use cases that you see around yeah. the new Reason? Yeah, so so I think probably the, the key thing about the Melbourne Reason launch is that, you know, globally, we operate 25 VMware Cloud on AWS regions now. Um, mm -hmm. In Asia Pacific, Pacific and Japan region, we have eight regions available to customers. Oh. 
So inside an AWS region, there's normally at least two, if not three, availability zones. And those are generally geographically distributed. Um, so they're not sitting right next to each other in the same building. Uh, so one of the key things, I guess, for our customers is that for those customers who've been wanting to, to have you know, access to VMware Cloud on AWS, but in a data center that's a little bit closer to their workloads, mm -hmm. the Melbourne region has basically you know, provided that opportunity for them to get access to a region that's not you know, sitting up in Sydney for our Melbourne customers, potentially some of our other customers down the, the southern part of Australia. They don't all need to go back to Sydney. Exactly. And we'll talk talk a little bit about that you know, uh, further along here as well. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the key use cases, and I'll talk about this, are, are resiliency um, for workloads across multiple regions, and then also data sovereignty concerns, mm -hmm. and then data locality as well. Um, those are probably the three key areas where the addition of a second region in Australia really makes a lot of sense for customers. Yeah, that sounds really great. Now, let's uh, dive a little bit deep into resiliency and availability, and how does this Melbourne region uh, that is now available actually help with this resiliency and availability? Yeah, thanks. So, so by default, we offer you know the ability to deploy, as I mentioned before, in twenty five global AWS regions, and each of these have a certain level of redundancy, you know, in order to minimize downtime. So, there's multiple availability zones inside each region, and these are isolated from each other. So, if one availability zone for some reason has an issue, mm -hmm. the other availability zone is not going to be impacted by that. Right. And then within this, we offer basically the the availability as well to do what we call partition placement groups. Now, these aren't customer configurable. But they certainly play an important part. So by that we mean when you deploy a certain number of nodes in VMC on AWS, um, we don't put all those nodes in the one rack because if that rack had a problem, you know, you, you would lose your whole environment. So what we do is we automatically distribute those workloads across multiple racks to ensure that even within the same availability zone, yes, you're not going to have an issue if a rack goes dark or a node goes out for whatever reason. So does that mean that each of these nodes will sit on a different rack? So if one rack fails, it doesn't impact the other nodes? That's the idea, yeah. Yeah, we don't let you that configure that, but we do We do ensure, you know, as part of our distribution of the workloads, when you deploy a cluster, that all those nodes go into different racks to ensure that you've got you know, the best chance of resiliency in the case of a, a rack-based failure. Sounds good. If you're familiar with the way we do VMware on-prem, um, ERS is, is a, sort of an extension of that. So we call it Elastic Distributed Resource Scheduler. Mm -hmm. And basically, when you hit a certain threshold of of storage utilization in your cluster, for example, or potentially you could configure it for CPU and RAM as well, yep. will scale out your hosts to ensure that you've got enough uh, resources available mm -hmm. in an on-demand fashion to keep those hosts running and workloads you know, happy. Right. And so when you scale out, what we do then is we resolve the issue, or potentially you resolve the issue with your workloads, mm -hmm. um, and we take care of that. But another thing we do as well is that we offer the ability to do automatic node replacement if there's a problem with the node. So if you've got 10 nodes in a cluster and one of those goes bang, within a few minutes, we replace that node with a, another node to ensure that your cluster keeps running as smoothly as possible. And a key part of this is that we use the existing, you know, things that you know and love about VMware is that things like uh, VM high availability, you know, we can basically power on those VMs on another node straight away and keep you get you back up and running as quickly as possible. Yes. So there's a lot uh, less requirement for you to you know, intervene manually. There's a lot of auto remediation that happens in the platform. Right, and it's all part of our service, right? Life cycling, and absolutely. Also, it's auto healing, which is fantastic, and like most of the cloud resources, you know, they have that feature auto healing. So it's exactly like that, yeah. Yeah, and what you really, really don't want to have to do is get involved in your infrastructure. You really want it to sort of take care of itself and focus on running your workloads as best they can. Absolutely. And a bigger part of this, I guess, is disaster recovery as well. So there's a, a few VMware-based tools that we offer for disaster mm -hmm. recovery, mm -hmm. including we do stretch clusters for availability, so you can run identical workloads uh, across multiple availability zones. At this stage, you have two availability zones. And then we offer the ability to do you know, some disaster recovery tools like VMware Site Recovery and VMware Cloud Disaster Recovery as well. Right. So we can run both VMware Site Recovery, which is also a managed service, as well as VCDR on two availability zones, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And we can do that. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this. We can do that across regions as well. So that's where it begin, begins to get very interesting from an availability perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of DR as a service, like you said, VMware has VSR, which is VMware Site Recovery, comes up as a managed service, essentially SRM being managed by VMware ourselves. VCDR is another one. Talk about uh, this DR as a service and how Melbourne Regions Launch actually helps with finding this DR as a solution and help me to get any disaster recovery situation for our customers. Yeah, so at the moment, we offer two different solutions for disaster recovery as a service uh, on the VMware Cloud and AWS platform. So as you mentioned, we do VMware Cloud Disaster Recovery and VMware Site Recovery. So if you're familiar with Site Recovery Manager on-premises, VMware Site Recovery is a version of that as a service that we offer. That's what we call hot DRAS. Mm -hmm. um, and VMware Cloud Disaster Recovery is a slightly different approach to that. It's really more an on-demand DRAS solution. Yeah. So some of the key things to understand is that if you have a recovery point objective that is lower than 30 minutes, VMware Site Recovery 
is a good solution for you. Mm -hmm. But if you can withstand a, a recovery point objective of 30 minutes or greater, VMware Cloud Disaster Recovery may be a more cost-effective solution. Right. And the reason I say that is that VMware Cloud Disaster Recovery has a slightly different approach to how it stores snapshots and what the, the number of nodes that you would need to do to use to recover in the event of a disaster. Mm -hmm. With VCDR as well, we have quite a deep snapshot history, whereas with VMware Site Recovery, we support 24 snapshots per VM. So it really depends on your requirements in terms of both recovery time objective, whether you need those workloads up and running within you know, a few minutes, the frequency that you want to snapshot those workloads, you know, what you can tolerate in terms of how many snapshots you need to keep with your disaster recovery solution would really determine uh, how you approach your DRAS with VMware's native tools. And also the topology as well. So VCDR supports protecting on-premises workloads and VMC-based workloads. Mm -hmm. VSR has some more support for a different topology such as you know, if you needed to, protecting back from cloud back onto on-premises. And obviously you've got the on-premises version inside Recovery Manager, which gives you that, that capability to do quite flexible topologies as well. Mm -hmm. So depending on the RPU and RTU requirement from a customer, they can pick and choose either VCDR or VMware Site Recovery, right? As yeah. you said, VSR may be a little bit expensive and VCDR may be a little bit cheaper, but depending on what their requirements are, they can pick and choose this managed services from VMware, isn't it? That's right. And we have, we do have some customers who actually do, do a combination of both as well. So there is support for running both VCDR and VSR in the same environments. Uh, we don't support backing up the same VM yeah. with, with those two solutions at the same time. That's a little, little bit crazy, but... Uh, you certainly can, you know, for some environments, VCDR would be more appropriate yes. uh, than VSR, but but for some applications that absolutely need a very low RPO, VSR is a really good solution. Yeah, I can think of especially FSIs and, you know, the, those companies who run mission critical applications, they would want to see that RPO going down to five minutes and probably some not that so critical applications they can on VCDR, right, for um, 30 minutes RPO. Absolutely, absolutely. And some of these as well, it's important to understand, I guess, you know, even though the RPO may only be 30 minutes, you may have other tools available to you to decrease that RPO, you know, via native backup pro things like that, that you could oh, probably right. incorporate with VCDR to ensure that you got the RPO that you needed. Got it. Yeah, I like that combination of backup to lower down that RPO from 30 to even lower with, with a combination of backup pros. I, I like that, you know, innovative approach. Nice one. Yeah. And probably uh, just the, the last thing on this is that, you know, the DR orchestration is really key to both of these products. So they both give you the ability to orchestrate both your failover and your failback of workloads. So when things have gone really badly, uh, either on-premises or in the cloud, you know, these tools both give you the ability to do that in sort of a, a fairly integrated, well-integrated and well-orchestrated fashion, taking a lot of the guesswork out of how the order which which you need to recover VMs, things like that, all of that can be controlled. So it uh, makes it for a little little less stressful experience when you do have to recover from a serious disaster. Yeah, absolutely. For an enterprise grade disaster good products, orchestration is super important, right? You can't keep you know running around to see you know what sequences that VM should be recovered on the other reason or other AZ. So orchestration is super important. One thing I will also ask you about is the reporting. Uh, how does the reporting on this work, especially for compliance? Uh, if they, if someone wants to see, hey, this DR has been run properly and everything is you know properly backed up in the right places, and if needed, it can be recovered properly. How, how does that work? Yeah, so both of these both of these solutions offer the ability to generate reports, both for your test failover activities and mm -hmm. your actual failover activities. So many organizations have a requirement to do quarterly or six monthly, you know, DR testing of their environments. So what we do when we do a failover, a, a test failover or a real failover, we generate a report out of that. And you can provide that. That's a human readable report that you can you can give to an auditor and say, we've ticked the box, here's the VM running over on this side, we're good to go. Now we can fail it back. Here's where we failed it back. Here's what happened. So you can incorporate those reports into your, I guess, broader testing harness so that you can be sure that you've got all the bugs worked out and you know you can feel confident that when there is a problem, that failover is actually going to work for you. Yeah, I like that. I mean, that's also super critical, especially in a regular environment, right? Where they have requirement to test out these solutions. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's that's the key thing is that you can actually test this stuff. It's it's not theoretical, it's it's very practical and very capable in its ability. Absolutely. Now tell us about uh, how the Melbourne Reason launch with multi-reason support now actually helps with uh, DR uh, as a service solution. Yeah. So I guess, you know, if we take a step back and look at what we would do traditionally with VCDR, you know, our customers in the Sydney region right now, we would historically be positioning that they would maybe run their workloads either, you know, in a production availability zone, potentially even on premises. And we would approach them about protecting their data with VCDR, giving them access to a SaaS orchestrator, deploying a DRAS connector in their environment attaching a scale-out cloud file system to store the snapshots for them. Mm -hmm. And then when disaster strikes, we attach what we call the recovery SDDC or software defined data center mm -hmm. in that second availability zone. We give them the ability to live mount those VMs and get up and running straight away. Wow. <clears throat> so that's what we were able to do in the Sydney region. Now we have many customers who are accessing 
the capability of ECR to protect their production workloads, test their workloads, all kinds of workloads, both on-prem and in VMware Cloud on AWS through mm-hmm. to VCDR. But now if you imagine we do that, but we do that across regions. So instead of having protecting your workloads, I guess, from you know one availability zone to another, we can now do cross-region availability zone. Yep. So now that we have workloads available in both, both m- many regions, consider that we can might run a VMware Cloud on AWS workload in one uh, region, in one availability zone or multiple availability zones even. We then give them that same access to the SaaS orchestrator with VCDR, attach the scale cloud file system for their snapshots. But then if something goes wrong in that region, whether it's the Sydney region or the Melbourne region, they have the option to recover their data into that other region and get up and running straight away. Right. So they have the choice uh, to do this on demand. So you don't need to deploy any nodes. You can stand up the software to find data center within approximately two hours and then attach that scale out cloud file system to that recovery SCDC mm-hmm. and get up and running. If they have a you know a lower recovery time objective, mm-hmm. then they might run and run what we call pilot light, which is usually a minimum two or three node deployment of nodes as a small cluster. We attach the scale out cloud file system to that. We live mount the VMs on the scale out cloud file system. And then we have the CPU and memory resources available from that pilot like cluster to get them up and running straight away. And as more VMs come online, we can quickly scale out that cluster as well to make sure that they've got sufficient resources available for those workloads to get recovered and yeah, get running. Really exciting. Yeah, I like it. The multi, multi-region multi resilience, right? Uh, it actually improves the blast radius and helps with regional availability. One question I have is uh, the pilot light environment. So let's say you have a pilot light environment with two hosts. Can a customer, before the DR, right? Can a customer actually run additional workload in that pilot light environment? Yeah, absolutely. Because you're paying for that pilot light environment 24-7, you really want to get the best value out of it. So uh, many of our customers are looking to leverage those clusters um, as test dev resources. So taking away some of the workloads they might be using on-prem or in other parts of the cloud and running those workloads on pilot light clusters instead. Mm-hmm. And then when it comes to recovery, they need to make it, they obviously need to make a choice. Do they shut down the test dev and focus on the production recovery, which, which generally speaking is what people like to do. But they could also choose to just continue to scale out that pilot light environment and ensure they've got sufficient resources to run both production and test dev on those clusters if they needed to. Now, apart from this, are there any other use cases or anything that our customers are looking for with this multi-region availability? Yeah, well, there are a few other reasons why you might want to be interested in a multi-region capability for VMA Cloud on AWS. So many of our customers are constrained by you know, data sovereignty requirements. So there's a variety of legal, regulatory, and administrative obligations that they, they have to work within mm-hmm. to ensure that data is stored in the right place. Right. So you know, even though Australia is one country, there are many states, many different um, you know, jurisdictions covering, I guess, where data can and can't be. And so for some of those companies, they you know have previously not had the ability to store certain types of data in the Sydney region. You know, in Victoria, for example, that they're not allowed to have that data across state lines for a variety right. of reasons. So this gives them the opportunity to run those workloads in the Melbourne region comfortably. And it, you know, they still get access to multiple availability zones with VMA Cloud on AWS. Mm-hmm. They get access to all of the, the VMA Cloud on AWS services plus the native AWS services. And it gives them that same experience that they would have if they were running this these workloads in the city region. I know that there would be customers who who may be waiting for this reason, so they can actually host their workloads within Melbourne region, right? So now able to use VMware Cloud AWS in Melbourne. That is very neat. Yeah. I don't want another locality. Yeah. What is what is that? Yeah. Well, I mean, this is another reason why some customers, you know, haven't been prepared, I guess, to adopt VMware Cloud on AWS fully yet, is because they wanted to talk about data locality. So this is the idea that, you know, for various reasons, you may have a workload that that resides in a certain location, uh, usually on premises. Mm-hmm. It could be a mainframe. Uh, based application, it may reach out and talk to a bunch of other applications. If you move those applications a little bit further away, um, i.e. the Sydney region, for example, Mm. while we've got fairly good bandwidth between Melbourne and Sydney, and we've obviously got reasonably good latency, Mm. there there are some speed of light considerations that some of these applications just don't tolerate having applications be that far away. So for those customers who have that sort of latency sensitive requirement, and they have workloads in Melbourne that simply can't move, not everyone is virtualized everywhere. Um, These are the kind of applications that are really well suited to be to be running in that Melbourne region. And some other customers as well, you know, they're looking for the opportunity, to, I guess, to bring, they're putting up with with having things in the Sydney region because that was their only option. Mm-hmm. Now they do have the option to bring those that data a little bit closer to where maybe their endpoints are, maybe where those edge workloads are, are coming in from. A lot of, you know, customers who potentially have regional workloads, mm-hmm. drawing those into Melbourne as a central you know, hub for those workloads, and then being able to keep that within the Melbourne region makes it a lot simpler for some of those regional based organizations as well to access that as opposed to going up to Sydney or all their data requirements. Yeah, in addition exactly. to that, they, they may also have you know, native services running mm-hmm. um, in, in Melbourne. Melbourne. And, yep. That's right. Yep. And they can uh, they can get close, you know, better access, I guess, both to those native services and have those talking to, to data 
yeah, within the same metropolitan area, which is quite good as well from a performance yeah, I like perspective. I, I absolutely like it. They're reducing the latency, proximity to all the services that they have. Not only that, also proximity to the users who are already, let's say, Melbourne-based. Now they can consume everything within Melbourne, right? That that helps with performance, that helps with latency. And yeah, that also helps with the user experience. I, I really like it. Yeah, absolutely. And they can still, you know, I guess you're know, talking about the disaster recovery options before, they could still then consider Sydney as their recovery SDDC if they needed to. So they could have all that data sitting nice and close in Melbourne, but if something goes wrong in Melbourne region, they can have that you know restored into the Sydney region fairly quickly if needs be. Excellent, yeah, I, I like all these uh, great use cases. Now, in terms of demonstration, can you demonstrate how the new region looks like in the console? Yeah, so it's fairly um, it's fairly simple. Basically, you, you navigate to cloud.vmware.com, you mm -hmm. log in with your, into your cloud services console, and from there you click on the, your VMC on AWS tile, right. click on your inventory, and then you just go create a software defined data center. And now we have the Asia, Asia Pacific brackets Melbourne region available mm -hmm. um, for both I4Is and I3ENs. You'll note that we don't offer I3 access in the Melbourne region. Mm -hmm. That's because we're phasing that node type out moving forward. So you'll see us talk about I3EN and I4I metal hosts as the way forward. But you can deploy, as you can see here, you've got single host, multi host, mm -hmm. or stretch cluster options. So we have three availability zones running in Melbourne. <clears throat> you can do a minimum number of hosts. Mm -hmm. And it's it's as simple as clicking through in your cloud services console and you're good to go. Excellent. So basically, you just need to go to the cloud console and pick the AWS region as SAP Pacific Melbourne, and then to the right host types, uh, number of hosts, etc. And yeah, and, and you just get it there, right? Okay. Yep. Yep. And you're good to go from there. Yeah. This is excellent. Is there anything else we need to cover? I don't think so. I think I think probably it's important to understand, you know, with VMware Cloud on AWS, we do have public sizing tools available if customers mm -hmm. are interested, you know, or, or thinking about VMware Cloud on AWS. We'd always recommend you come and talk to someone at VMware about it before you uh before you make your mind up fully, but if you want to go and poke around and see what things cost, see how it might look from a deployment perspective, yeah, you know, we do give you the ability to import some of your own configurations in and have a look at that all on the, the VMware Cloud on AWS website. Yeah, for customers who want to do some proof of concept, et cetera, how about that? Do we have any such facilities? We do. We do have some uh, VMware Cloud on AWS trial programs and VMware Cloud disaster recovery trial programs as well. So you can reach out to your local account teams and they'll be able to help you get started with that. Excellent. So there we go. If anyone is looking for POC and see how VMware Cloud AWS looks like or our disaster recovery products looks like, yeah, absolutely reach out to our VMware representatives and they will be happy to help you. Thanks, Dan. This is really insightful. Uh, we understood the significance of Melbourne region and how it actually helps with various use cases for our customers and partners in ANZ and beyond. So really appreciate that, Mike. Thanks very much for having me, Satya. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me about the Melbourne region. Uh, and I'm excited to see how our customers adopt it in the future. Thank you, everyone, for being here with us today. We hope you found this video helpful. We look forward to seeing you again in our other videos. Take care and bye for now.